Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome John Hagel to the program today. He's a Silicon Valley veteran, author, and co-chairman of a pretty cool center, Deloitte's Center for the Edge. And today we're going to try to make sense of this upside-down world we're all living in from the business side and figure out how do you kind of navigate and explore this uh, uh, landscape and still get back to looking at emerging opportunities. Talk a little bit about his book and why a lot of the topics that he works on and the research he does is not on enough CEOs' agendas these days, even before a pandemic hit the planet. So, John, welcome. It's good to see you. How's California? Blue skies and sunshine. I'm very grateful to be here. Yeah, yeah. I miss living out there. It was awesome. You know, maybe to start out, everyone knows who Deloitte is, but uh, let's talk about what is Center for the Edge. You're the co-chairman. I assume you started it, too. Tell us about it. Yeah, I was brought into uh, Deloitte uh, 13 years ago now to set up this new research center, the Center for the Edge. And the charter we have is basically to identify emerging business opportunities that should be on the CEO's agenda but are not, and do the research to persuade them to put it on the agenda. So we're unlike many research centers where you just wait for somebody to call you and ask you for to do research on something. For us, if they're calling us, it's too late. Right, exactly. You've already missed the opportunity or you're being disrupted uh, by some irritating company somewhere. So Mm -hmm. what types of projects are you working on? What's when you say research, it seems like it's more hands on than, you know, academic research, which is great. But give us some insights into, well, first, some just kind of, you know, take the cover off. Tell us what kinds of things you work on and then we'll get into some insights in your learnings. Sure. So over the 13 years, we've basically focused on three research streams. One stream has to do with looking at the long-term forces that are reshaping the global economy. We call it the big shift. We believe there is a profound transformation occurring. So that's one stream. Second stream is, okay, so what are the opportunities that are emerging as a result of all these changes and focusing on specific opportunities? And then there's a, a third stream, which is a reaction we get from a lot of executives when we talk about the big shift is they say, wait a minute, we're way over here. You're telling us we need to be way over there. How the hell do we get from here to there? It's just too overwhelming. And so we focus on what we call pragmatic pathways that can help large traditional institutions make that transition. Yeah. Kellogg, I call those BFSs, big, fat, and slow, uh, which is, you know, what a lot of companies are in terms of, you know, their size and scope. How do you get them to be more agile and actually focus on this stuff? Uh, It's complicated. I mean, I think that um, one of the things that I've come to, I've been involved in transformation efforts for for quite a while. And one one key lesson that I take away from all of this is uh, never, ever underestimate the immune system that exists in every large institution. And the, the slightest sign of change will mobilize to crush. And so the challenge is how do you change without exciting the immune system. And for us, we've developed an approach that we call scaling the edge, which is rather than trying to go top down, big bang, transform everything in the core, find an edge that if you understand the forces that are reshaping the economy, that edge can scale to the point where it becomes the new core of your business Exactly. and focus the change on that edge versus again, trying to do it in the existing core. So before we get into a couple edge examples, let's back up to your first thing, which was massive shifts going on, even pre-pandemic. What what are your what are your favorite shifts to talk about or to scare CEOs with? Maybe it's the better <laughs> the, maybe it's the better term. Well, you know, I I I, often, I love the concept of paradox, and I I frame the big shift as a paradox. On right. the one side, it's creating exponentially expanding opportunity. We can create far more value with far less resource, far more quickly than would have ever been imaginable 10, 20 years ago. Huge opportunity. Same time, it's creating mounting performance pressure. There's intensifying competition. The pace of change is accelerating. 
extreme events come in out of nowhere and quickly cascade into global events, witness our current uh, pandemic. So a lot of pressure. And, and the, the one piece of evidence I use to document the pressure is we looked at um, return on assets for all public companies in the U.S. from 1965 until today. Right. Turns out over that time period, return on assets has basically collapsed. It's gone down by 75%. And it's been a long, sustained erosion. And I use it to drive home the point, this isn't something out in the distant future. This is something today. And in fact, it's been happening for quite a while. We're still in the early stages, but it's been happening around us. We just haven't seen it. Yeah, I read, I read that report. It was actually really well done. I mean, you guys do a lot of good research, but that one was very poignant. However, does it bring up the fact that maybe just measuring the return on assets is not the best thing these days? Because other companies, while that was going on, came out of nowhere, like Salesforce. So if you were Oracle, um, you know, even though Mark Benioff worked at Oracle, um, you know, you could have done that and kind of not worried about how you measure certain things. So is that part of their problem too? They're using an old standard for measurement about uh, how you fund and grow these new initiatives? I'd say the big challenge, uh, one of the big issues, and again, I think it's a natural human reaction to mounting pressure, is we shorten our time horizons. If we're under pressure and afraid, we just look very in the very short term. And you know, it's the quarterly performance that right. we know all CEOs are, are driven by. And that is a problem because it, it blinds you to the more fundamental changes that are occurring and to the big opportunities that are out in the, in the future beyond the next quarter. You're just not gonna pay attention to them. Yeah, exactly. What, um, so what are some of the big trends you're seeing now, just kind of present day, we're in the, we'll talk about kind of opening the economy and what these big companies should do, but what are some of your favorite trends? You could pick a sector if you want, retail, um, B2B, whatever, one you're uh, most, uh, whatever one you're yeah, working well, on these days. Well, I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, there's a huge debate in Silicon Valley. It's been going on for decades around the future. And right. on the one side, there, there's a point of view which is very passionately held that the impact of all these changes is we're going to see more and more fragmentation. We're going to go down to the level of individual contractors. They'll just freely associate when they need to. But companies are dinosaurs. It's all about fragmentation down to the individual. Another side of Silicon Valley equally passionately argues the future is all about concentration. Because of network effects, we're going to see four or five global mega corporations that capture the vast portion of the wealth. Everybody else is going to be marginalized. Yeah, a lot of people feel that in Silicon Valley, by the way. You know, if you're not at Facebook, Google, Netflix, Amazon, a couple others, you're, you're just not yeah. with it. But I, I, I don't subscribe to that totally, but go ahead. No, so uh, the, we took on the debate as part of our research. And, and by the way, the first, is the first sector more like, hey, it's gig economy, we don't, we don't need all these office buildings. And the other theory is it's the, it's the, you know, the consolidation of the big guys. Are, are those the two? Um, Pretty much. I mean, opposed? gig economy could still have large companies, you know, that you're working as a contract worker for. No, right. this is, we're all independent entities and we're freely um, associating to... To do it. things so when it's needed but so it's a couple steps into the future got it okay yeah yeah and you know we took this on and in classic consulting fashion we came to the conclusion that both sides are right um and the answer the answer is what part of the economy are you looking at so uh, at a very high level we came to the point of view that because of the way customer needs are evolving and at a high level, again, their focus, custom, we as customers are more and more demanding, and we're less and less willing to settle for mass market standardized products and services. We want something that's tailored to our specific needs. And our, our view is that is going to drive, and, and a set of technology and economic changes are going to drive fragmentation of product and service businesses. We're going to see a shift from these large standardized mass market product companies down to very small, profitable, niche-oriented businesses that are targeting very specific customer segments. That's the fragmentation piece. On the concentration yeah, uh, side, 
Right. That, I was just going to say at Revive, we call that, you know, hyper personalization. So it's happening in, in cosmetics, it's happening in beauty. We've actually got a couple of entrepreneurs coming on uh, in, the, in the coming weeks who have scaled it uh, globally. Um, so hyper personalization, customization. Got it. Yeah. My favorite example is uh, Kraft chocolate. Yeah. You know, it used to be there were five brands of chocolate. You could have any brand you want, but just with those five and pretty right. standard stuff. Now it's very niche oriented, you know, specialized chocolate for specialized tastes. And so anyway, that's one side of the economy. The other side is the view that um, we're going to see more concentration around what we call infrastructure management businesses, high mm -hmm. volume routine processing activities, could be running large data centers, could be running logistics networks, high volume routine processing. And then on the other side, there's a big opportunity that we, it's speculative, but we believe is going to be very large in the future, is what we call the trusted advisor. As we see more and more fragmentation of products and services, we as customers are going to value having somebody that we trust, right. who knows us extremely well, and can help connect us to the most relevant products and services at the right time. And our belief is those businesses actually have powerful economies of scope. The more I know about you as an individual customer, the more helpful I can be. If I just see a small slice of who you are, I'm not going to be as helpful. And the more other customers I'm serving, the more helpful I can be to you as an individual because I can start to see patterns and say, you know, customers like you have gotten huge value from this product or service. You haven't even asked for it. Yeah, and Part technology, of the world is I'm sorry, technology is caught up to actually with AI to actually enable that. We, we we used to call, we still call that kind of influencer marketing, but you're saying that's going to turn into an entire industry because it's all about me. It's not about me going to 20 brands. It's about one one group helping me get everything I need. And and I think the interesting challenge for existing companies is I, I, I often challenge and say, well, if you really want to be trusted mm -hmm. and all you're doing is recommending your own products and services, Good luck. So the true trusted advisor is going to recommend whatever product or service, whoever makes it, even if it's a competitor. And ideally, our view is the trusted advisors won't have products or services of their own. No, nope. they're just going to help connect you with whatever is most relevant. So um, let's just touch on all three of those because I could say that you described Amazon on all three of those. Uh, you know, one is they become this. I'm maybe not trusted, but a marketplace. So they've done that. Walmart has copied that. It's like, let's have all the entrepreneurs and the gigsters and the independents on our platform. We can choose who's on and who's not, but let's also uh, let that kind of, uh, you know, and, and they're also kind of this infrastructure player that you um, talked about, especially during the pandemic. They've become, they've gone from uh, essential to almost infrastructure type of company, like the post office, Walmart, kind of a close second. The, you know, the amount of people that are relying on it. Um, I've, I see those two kind of moving forward in the utility part. Can can these businesses actually play in all three playgrounds? Our, our belief is no, you have to choose what mm -hmm. business are you really in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I like to use the example. So, I mean, one issue that I think Amazon is facing today is increasingly they're starting to make their own products and services. Exactly. And competing. Yeah. With the companies that are on their platform, it's been a couple articles a about it. That, uh, a couple articles about how they're um, they might have done that a little bit more aggressively than they should. <laughs> well, I would say shouldn't do it at all because if well, you're I mean, a lot of retailers competing, have retailers have competing. generic brands. You know, Target, CVS, Walmart, Walgreens. A lot of them have the generic brands, but you're saying, yeah, but they're they're not putting those guys out of business. Amazon actually is. Is that the idea, or they're taking them off the platform once they? Come up with their own. It, is that the it's point? It's just that it it undermines trust. If you are supposedly going to help me connect with customers, and you have competing products and services, uh, of course, yep. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the platforms that are going to win are those that stay out of the product and service business and say, no, we're here to help you get to reach your customers wherever they are, and and do the infrastructure support the. Amazon is doing uh, in terms of their fulfillment centers and other things. So, yeah. So, 
Fascinating. We do um, at, at Kellogg School, I teach a program. It's almost like a corporate accelerator program where companies come in and they sponsor five student teams to invent new products. And many of these products have actually been launched into market. Um, but at, at the most these days, they look at kind of influencer marketing. They look at which startups these companies might want to invest in or buy. But kind of breaking it up in these three categories, it seems like, I mean, how far out are these business models? I, I see a few companies not necessarily choosing, but dabbling in each one. But is this a five-year thing, 10-year thing? You're going to have to pick a swim lane? No, well, in, in my uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, um, <laughs> the uh, sci-fi author who said, uh, the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So if you look around, I mean, yeah. we're seeing the growth of infrastructure management businesses. They're becoming very concentrated. Logistics, fulfillment, data center operations. <laughs> Those are becoming more and more specialized and focused and, uh, and very protective. Once you've invested in all, it's hard for someone else to jump in. Yeah, yeah. And then we're seeing fragmentation occur in certain markets, not all. It started, I believe, in the digital space with things like video and music and software. Now mm -hmm. it's going into things like chocolate and beer and other products and services, starting Food. to yep. see this fragmentation go on. I think the big, uh, you know, more speculative one is this trusted advisor uh, opportunity where I think you can see early signals. So one example is um, we've spent a fair amount of time looking at wellness coaches, right. people who have emerged to really help people, not just, you know, to stay well and, and improve their physical performance and uh, rather than just wait to get sick. And those wellness coaches are developing deep trust. They, they can see you uh, in terms of your heartbeat on a minute by minute basis. And they're connecting their customers with providers of wellness services that are relevant to them based on their physical condition. Exactly. We had uh, Naveen Jain on the program uh, last week and um, talking about the personalization of supplements and these things. And, and that that still called influencer kind of audience is becoming more and more important, whether it's their doctor, which people are kind of moving away from, or whether it's kind of a health fitness life coach, um, whatever, whatever that is. And that fits into a lot of the uh, personalizational models as well. That's why I asked if maybe the two go together, but mm -hmm. I get the trust. I get the trust thing. How does this, um, I mean, it's very insightful, but how does it um, transform right now how these big, huge companies, let's call it just the fortune 200s or the global 500 around the world. You know, how do they, a lot of them have moved to co-creation and open innovation and labs and dancing with startups. And so they've kind of gotten that, they've gotten that into their system a little bit. We've helped them in, through various organizations, including yours, but how does that become more systemic to kind of plotting around, Hey, we were a manufacturer of goods and factories. We need to move into more of this role. It sounds painful for some companies. Yeah, I think uh, there are many different uh, components that have to come together. We, we've been a strong advocate of a different approach to strategy that's kind of a, an opening way to think through this. And we right. call it zoom out, zoom in. But it's this notion of in a rapidly changing world, you have to focus on two time horizons in parallel. And by the way, this is very much influenced by my experience working with some of the most successful tech companies because they they have pursued this strategy. Uh, they didn't call it zoom out, zoom in, but um, it basically the two horizons are 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And on that horizon, the two questions are, what's our market or industry going to look like 10 to 20 years from now? And what are the implications for the kind of company or business we're going to need to be to address the biggest opportunities? So that's 10 to 20 years, zoom out, zoom in. Very different horizon, six to 12 months. And on that horizon, the questions are, what are the two or three initiatives, no more, two or three, that we can pursue in the next six to 12 months that will have the greatest impact in accelerating our movement towards that longer term destination? And do we have a critical mass of resources against those two or three initiatives? And then constantly balancing between the two, learning from the short term action to refine your view of the future, using that view of the future to help focus your shorter term initiatives more tightly. So it's a, a learning mindset of, you know, we, we just want to uh, learn as quickly as we can and address sure. really big sure. opportunities. 
So let's zoom in then. Um, so I, I, you and I have both seen a lot of these corporations zoom in plans during 2019, and now a wrench has been thrown into everything. So with a global pandemic, it's who, whoever would thought everything would shut down. Um, on this program, going back to 2008, we try to cover topics that are more timeless and they something you can use. You can actually tune into some of the episodes from years ago and they're still relevant. So we try not to get too topical, but you cannot help it. So. <laughs> And right now there's CEOs having conference calls and they're talking more about how do we open up my building? How are we going to manage the elevators? How are we going to take people's temperatures? These are CEOs of major corporations down to the operations level of the companies. Now, um, how did these guys get back? Let's just say they get open, you know, they get people working, they figure out the distancing and people working at home versus there. So we don't have to get into this operationally. How do they actually get back to growth and innovation agendas? Well, I think again, it's it's pulling them out of that short-term mindset and really focusing them first of all on what is the big opportunity that's out there in the future that we could be targeting. But then again, being very demanding about what are you going to do in the next six to twelve months? That's aggressive. I hate the words pilots, experiments. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just dabbling. You're they just dabbling. Yes, you need yes. to commit. What is it you're committing to and how aggressive can you be in the next six to 12 months to get to that bigger opportunity? Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, some of the mid-sized corporations right now, uh, they pulled back on their M&A and their, and their corporate venture capital stuff. I mean, it's on hold. I mean, they're dealing with the pandemic. But you see Microsoft and Google and Amazon, it's like a, an amazing opportunity for, for M&A which is growth and innovation and, you know, acquisition of new technologies. Uh, they're taking advantage of the dip, you know, valuations are down. So oh, there are yeah. some companies that are, some companies that are back to focusing, but it's really tough. I mean, if they were short-term focused from their culture point of view before this, now they're really short-term. They're like, yes, it's life <laughs> and death, life and death short-term. Who gets to go in the elevator? How many, up too many people get off. So um, not to make fun of it, but it's, there's a, no, there's, no, a lot I, of, I, there's a lot of rebooting that needs to be done here. And, from a digital perspective, most of the digital CEOs I talked to were saying, um, and I agree, it's like, you know, people like us have been trying to help companies with digital transformation for 10 years, and we think it's just accelerated by 10 years, at least with consumers. You know, there's more people using technology now than there was at Christmas time. I don't know what the percentage is, but it might be a good Deloitte study. <laughs> it's just so what we've seen at Revive is like 400% surge in people using online selfies and personalized, you know, analysis before they buy something. It's like that. That's massive spikes. It's not just because they have more time. They've been forced into a situation where they're using more remote technology. So same thing with the innovation teams and organizations. You know, they're all learning how to collaborate around the world better, work at home. Do you think that's going to help accelerate the pace of corporate innovation? You know, it will help at one level. I, I also have a bit of an issue with the digital transformation frame that everybody's I meant, using. I didn't, I didn't mean to use that word. I, no, 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 no. Out, as soon as it came out of my mouth, it sounded so corporate. When, when, I, when I push on what they mean by digital transformation, most executives, basically what they're talking about is doing things faster and cheaper exactly. with digital technology. It's all about scalable and, and efficiency just, and just re-engineering re re what they already do versus yeah. what you're saying. You're saying is no, right. well, come up with an entirely different business model. Yeah, no. And, and so the metaphor I like to use is the caterpillar and the butterfly. I mean, transformation is moving from a caterpillar to a butterfly. If you're just making the caterpillar walk faster, that ain't <laughs> transformation. I mean, it may be helpful to the caterpillar, but let's be clear. It's not transformation. So. There's an obsolescence uh, joke in there too. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Um, any other trends you're seeing out there that you're, uh, let's just say, optimistic about? Oh, boy, um, you know, I think that I am inherently an optimist in the sense that I do believe. If certainly, if you look throughout history, we have, uh, as a human race, we have. Mm -hmm. been able to thrive through any particular challenges or crises uh, in history and move forward, advance forward. And I think that ultimately the the big challenge I, I see is, I, you know, I, I joke that my career has been in a business strategy, but 
I've, over time, I've become more and more convinced it's less about strategy and it's more about psychology. And that if we don't understand the emotions that are driving people, um, we're never going to get the actions we need to have impact and, and really address opportunities. And to me, the big challenge right now is the dominant emotion is fear. And this was even before the current pandemic. I think yep. I was struck around the world the number of times with senior executives, with people in lower in the organization, out in the community, fear was the thing that was driving them. And until and unless we find a way to address, first of all, acknowledge that, because most won't even acknowledge it, but then address it and overcome it, I think we're going to have a challenge. Yeah, a lot of books, a lot of books, a lot of books, a lot of seminars, a lot of self-help about that, but it's still there. It's there rippling yeah. around, rippling around corporations. Um, in your book, you, you cite, obviously, we, we, I thought it was a great read. Um, it's, it's somewhat timeless. What, um, what can people get out of it? How can it help them if they pick it up? Because people have a little extra time right now to read. Notice. <laughs> no, well, I think the, the key themes in the book, first of all, we explored the big shift, the, the forces that are train changing the economy. So it's challenging people to move out of that narrow view and see the world more broadly. But then again, the subtitle of the book was Small Moves Smartly Made Can Set Big Things in Motion. So it's really challenging people to say, what can I do now smartly that really would address really big opportunities? And that that's the, the way forward is not to try to, you know, overwhelm yourself with too much. Just be very targeted. Um, but in the context of what's the big opportunity that really could change you. Yeah, I'm seeing that in tech companies and non-tech. It's even in the acquisitions they make. They're they're designed to do one or two things that either they don't do well or they can't get it done quick enough uh, versus the big, massive, mega acquisitions, which is, yeah. you know, seems like a good trend. Yeah. So, uh, John, we want to thank you for being on today. Any uh, Just any parting comments, words of wisdom? I know you wish you were probably out of your house, but uh, anything, for, uh, <laughs> anything for people to think about as they're getting ready to go back to the office someday here? Yeah, well, I think that one of the interesting things that I'm seeing in the people that I talk to is the the number who are saying that they've used this time to really reflect on what's important, what's meaningful to them, and uh -huh. discovering that actually they're spending most of their time on things that are not meaningful. And this has been an opportunity to step back and say what really uh, is meaningful. And in that context, and we briefly talked about it in the book, Power of Pull, it's this notion of finding what we call the passion of the explorer, a passion that can really drive you to overcome the fear, to take bold moves and really make a difference and have meaning in your life. And so our, our, my advice is find that passion of the explorer if you don't already have it and uh, figure out how to make a living from it because that's the key to the future. I love it. I love Sounds it. Great. Okay. great. So you've been listening to John Hagel, who is the uh, co-chairman of Deloitte's uh, Center for the Edge and uh, author of a great book. I really uh, appreciate you guys picking it up. Uh, next time, uh, kind of just to uh, build on uh, John's thoughts, we have um, Praveer Malik from Zappos, who is an amazing guy. And we're going to talk about how to harness light and love and bring it into your organization and, and into your company, especially when things are starting to open back up. So, John, thanks. We really appreciate it and uh, hope to see you soon in person. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>